In my last part one episode on rates of return, I covered the holy grail of portfolio performance benchmarking, your time-weighted rate of return. Unfortunately, even holy grails have their limitations. In this case, even if you wanted to calculate the time-weighted rate of return for your do-it-yourself portfolio, you'd have a tough time finding the data to do so. I'm Justin Bender, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital in Toronto. If you've not yet watched my last episode on the time-weighted rate of return, I encourage you to go do so now, because today, we're turning our attention to a second way to wrap your head around your returns, your money-weighted rate of return. I'll also describe how and why the two methods can produce different results, so you can determine when each is most appropriate for you. Before we focus on the money-weighted rate of return, a brief recap is in order. Assuming you've now caught our part one episode on the time-weighted rate of return, you've now met our three fictional investors. First, there was Michael, who made no additions or extractions all year. Then there is Job, who added $10,000 to his portfolio on March 23rd. And last, there was Buster, who withdrew $10,000 from his portfolio on March 23rd. All three investors held all of their portfolio in the Vanguard Growth ETF portfolio Vigro. So all three earned Vigro's disappointing negative 22.01% return in a sub-period lasting from the beginning of the year until the March 23rd cash flow date. Each then earned Vigro's amazing positive 42.11% return during a second sub-period from March 23rd until the end of the year. Ultimately, all three earned Vigro's annual time-weighted rate of return of 10.83%. But even though all three of our hypothetical investors earned the same time-weighted rate of return, chances are they weren't equally satisfied with the results. This is due to those different cash flow choices each made. Job, who added more money at market bottom, benefited far more from the turnaround than Buster, who removed $10,000 from his portfolio just when things were about to get good again. We can use the same scenario we presented in part one to illustrate when a money-weighted rate of return can be more relevant to individual investors. Rather than removing the effect of cash flows, as a time-weighted rate of return is designed to do, a money-weighted rate of return shows the rewards or penalties investors receive from the individual timing of their contributions and withdrawals. Even if you preferred to think in terms of time-weighted rates of return, you'd still want to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the money-weighted method. That's because the Canadian Securities Administrators has made the money-weighted rate of return the industry standard for calculating the performance numbers you see in your account statements. So how do we come up with your money-weighted rate of return? It begins with what we financial nerds refer to as your portfolio's present value. For example, say someone offered to give you $100 one year from now. What is the present value of that future money? If we ignore inflation, the answer depends on the rate of return you expect to receive on your investments during the year. For example, assuming a 5% annual return, $100 paid to you in one year has a present value of around $95.24. Calculating a money-weighted rate of return involves finding the rate of return that makes the net present value of all cash flows equal to zero. Although this may seem like a daunting task, it's simplified with the help of the XIRR function in Microsoft Excel. We'll start by entering the beginning and end dates for our measurement period, as well as the dates of any portfolio cash flows in the rows between these dates. Next, we'll enter the starting portfolio value and any contributions, and these should be entered as positive values. Then, we'll enter the ending portfolio value and any withdrawals, and these should be entered as negative values. For example, our second investor, Job, would have had a positive $100,000 starting value on January 1st, 2020, a positive $10,000 contribution on March 23rd, 2020, and a negative $125,039 ending portfolio value on December 31st, 2020. Lastly, we'll use the XIRR formula to determine the money-weighted rate of return for each of our three investors. Once Excel has worked its wonders, we see that Michael has earned a money-weighted rate of return of 10.83% for 2020. Job's money-weighted rate of return is 13.97%. And Buster earned a 7.17% money-weighted rate of return. 
If you're paying close attention, you'll notice that Michael's time-weighted and money-weighted rate of return are an identical 10.83%. This is expected in scenarios where there have been no contributions to or withdrawals from the portfolio during the measurement period. For our other two investors, their money-weighted rates of return are noticeably different from their time-weighted rate of return, thanks to their cash flows. Job contributed $10,000 before a period of significant outperformance, positive 42.11% versus negative 22.01%. So he ended up with a much higher money-weighted rate of return of 13.97%. On the other hand, Buster withdrew $10,000 before that period of outperformance, which resulted in a much lower money-weighted rate of return of 7.17%. This will make intuitive sense to anyone who has added funds right before a bull market begins or withdrawn money at the tail end of a downturn. So let's review some important lessons here. First, the money-weighted rate of return assumes all cash flows receive the same rate of return while invested. This means, when large cash flows occur during volatile periods, the money-weighted rate of return can differ substantially from the time-weighted rate of return. That's why Job's 13.97% money-weighted return was significantly higher than his 10.83% time-weighted return. It's also why Buster's 7.17% money-weighted return was significantly lower than the same 10.83% time-weighted return. So, when you're interpreting money-weighted rates of return, remember what that might mean to your measurement. Here's a key takeaway. Depending on market conditions, if you happen to add or remove money to or from your portfolio at just the right or wrong times, your money-weighted rate of return can significantly over or understate your performance for the year, at least compared to your portfolio's time-weighted rate of return. I'm Justin Bender of PWL Capital, and if you enjoyed this video series, please subscribe to the Canadian Portfolio Manager YouTube channel. And if you'd like to learn more about calculating your ongoing investment performance, check out the white paper I co-authored with Dan Bortolotti entitled Understanding Your Portfolio's Rate of Return.